Hi, Bonte. Hi, Bob. Uh, how are you? Fine, thank you. Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, and we should maybe explain for some people that the Bhikkhu part uh, means monk and refers to the fact that you are an ordained Buddhist monk. You're, you're also a noted uh, thinker about Buddhism, and I would highly recommend your lectures on Buddhism, and we'll provide a link for people who want to download them. But you're particularly known as a translator of, uh, of things like this, the Connected Discourses of the Buddha. Oh, wow, that's very happy. Yeah. This is your, which is, runs over 2,000 pages, including your, uh, your, your annotated footnotes and, and index and so on. And you also translated other parts of the Buddhist canon, the, the middle-length discourses and so on. So that's a lot of work. And, and maybe I should start by asking you what inspired you to undertake such a vast commitment. Yeah, originally I had no intention to become a translator. But when I went to Sri Lanka, I went in 1972 to be ordained as a monk. I, I knew that I wanted to read the Buddha's discourses and to read them in the original, in the Pali language. Pali, it's an ancient Indian language, probably never really a spoken language, but rather a composite language, which was used to preserve the Buddha's discourses in the early schools of Buddhism. And so I wanted to be able to read them in the original. Um, and so I learned Pali. And then in order to you know, to understand them, I felt that I had to write out the translations, uh, to write out my mental translation as I was reading them. And then at a certain point, I showed them to some of my translations to an elder European monk in Sri Lanka, the German monk Venerable Nyanaponika, and he liked my translation, and then he could encourage me to continue doing translation. And you must have spent years and years and years doing this then. Well, I think I started doing translation in 1976. Yeah, in early 1976. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I'm still still at it. <laughs> well, the Buddha said a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and sometimes he said the same thing more than once in more than one way. Yeah, well, there's quite a lot of repetition in the early discourses. Yes, sometimes translators resort to ellipses, I've noticed. Uh, but now the computer programs with the with the word processing programs with the copy and paste makes it rather easy to translate. <laughs> well, that explains it. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't have... So you shouldn't have uh, it's, it's a bit... The volume of work is a bit deceptive yeah. because a lot of it was created using the copy and paste function. <laughs> now the truth comes out. It's commendable that you would be that honest. Um, I guess it means you're a good Buddhist. Uh, let me, uh, I want to talk about a lot of things, but let's start out with an issue of translation. Um, you commonly hear as a summary of one thing, the, a characterization of one thing the Buddhist said, is said to have said, life is suffering. Now, first of all, I'm not sure he ever actually says it quite like that. You tell me if he ever says that, uh, although it, it may, broadly speaking, capture his intent. But the other question, leaving aside whether he ever put it in the form of that kind of sentence, um, is the word suffering, which is a translation of the term dukkha. Right. Uh, and tell us whether suffering is really an adequate translation. I I don't think that the, the rendering of dukkha as suffering is adequate, even though I use it. When I use it as a translation, it has to be accompanied by some explanation of what is meant by dukkha. Now, the word dukkha originally in the early Indian languages would have meant pain and suffering, and it's contrasted with sukha. So sukha is pleasure or happiness, and dukkha is pain or suffering. But the Buddha took this word out of from ordinary discourse, and then he gave it a wider, more extended meaning. So that the word dukkha comes to mean something like, I would say, deficient, inadequate, unsatisfactory. And so when, and then the Buddha doesn't explicitly say, not to my recollection, that life is suffering. But what he says, for example, in the first noble truth is, 
that this is the noble truth of dukkha. And then he elaborates upon the different forms of dukkha. And now when he explains what he means by dukkha in greater detail, he sometimes explains that there are three aspects to dukkha. And I think this makes the meaning more clearer. Okay, so one aspect of dukkha is what is called dukkha dukkata, which means the unsatisfactoriness because of suffering. It's actually like a, a, a repetition. And so this is that there is unsatisfactoriness or deficiency in life because there is experience of pain, dejection, misery, disappointment, and various other experiences that we would group under the general label of maybe suffering is rather strong, but of pain and causes for dissatisfaction. Okay, but in the second aspect of dukkha is what is called the unsatisfactoriness due to change. And this is applied specifically to our pleasant experiences, pleasant experiences that are held to, that are grasped with an attitude of clinging to the pleasant experiences as a basis for satisfaction, clinging to them in the expectation that they'll be permanent and stable. And so when we cling to these pleasant experiences and then they change, then they eventuate in suffering. And so looking at them more deeply, we could see that even when we're experiencing the pleasant experiences, even when we've achieved what we take to be our satisfaction, then there's already a kind of subtle degree of deficiency or unsatisfactoriness underlying that pleasure, that happiness, because it's vulnerable to change and will produce suffering. So the future suffering is implicit in the current pleasure. Right. When that pleasure is held to with an attitude of you know, clinging and grasping. So, so if I eat a candy bar with the wrong attitude, so to speak, an attitude of grasping or thirst or craving, which, by the way, is the way I always eat a candy bar. <laughs> um, it, it's inevitable that the moment will come when it's over and I want more or I'm, you know, the sugar rush subsides or whatever. And so there's 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 something un, ultimately unsatisfying about it. And of course, you know, clinging to the enjoyable taste of a candy bar is a little bit innocent. But when people are, you know, grasping after accumulations of wealth, position, power, then sort of the underlying uncertainty of their position and the sort of ambience of anxiety surrounding it then becomes much more prominent and much more um, cutting. Now, the, pres the prescription, I mean, uh, as you kind of suggested, the Buddha isolates the cause of the suffering or unsatisfactoriness as thirsting, craving, trying to cling to, to pleasures. Yeah. Um, and the prescription is to not do yeah. that, to not desire things in that sense. Yeah. Somebody has just come to the door to bring me. It's my evening drink, I think. Oh, oh, you deserve that. So go ahead. Okay. Please come. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, we could continue. All right. Uh, the, um, the prescription sounds pretty severe. You know, he's asking us to rid ourselves of thirst, of desire, uh, almost of attraction to things. Okay. Let me just come to the third, because I was sure. going through the three aspects of dukkha. Okay, then the third aspect of dukkha is what is called um, sankara dukkata, which means it's a rather difficult expression to translate, but the way I would render it is the unsatisfactoriness, which is inherent in all conditioned phenomena. Okay, and this is a certain degree of unsatisfactoriness or inadequacy, which is intrinsic to all conditioned phenomena, simply by the fact that they are conditioned, that they're subject to constant arising and passing away. 
that they are empty of any kind of substantial core. And, and does conditioned mean caused or? Yeah, brought about by causes and conditions. And the unconditioned yeah. is, is equated with nirvana, right? Yeah, that is correct. So you have, so to achieve, to, to reach nirvana is to escape the world of the merely conditioned and, 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 and the world of the cause. In the right, right, yeah. But to Maybe, reach, uh, sorry. Yeah, if one was to use the kind of language that comes out of the Christ, Christian tradition, one might say sankara dukkata, the unsatisfactoriness of the conditioned, might be equated with the sense of the unsatisfactoriness of contingency, that all things that are contingent are not really able to fully satisfy maybe the human spirit. But to get to that uh, state of nirvana or liberation, complete liberation from dukkha, yeah. is it fair to say that it's necessary to, well, certainly you have to let go of desire of lust of thirst and yeah. and so on but is is it fair to say almost that you have to transcend attraction itself and aversion itself attraction to things that are that are likable and aversion to things that people generally don't like i would say that one has to transcend attraction or attachment to things which are provocative of craving but i would say that there are I would call them innocent pleasures, <laughs> which can be enjoyed without necessarily provoking craving and attachment. For example, I would say that enjoyment of the beauties of nature, that or that the beauties of nature are not necessarily objects of attachment and attraction, in the sense that there's a craving underlying that. And is there a way to even savor food, enjoy food without attachment? Actually, what I find is that when one practices eating with mindfulness, one can enjoy the taste of the food without a craving arising and underlying that experience of enjoyment. And maybe this is kind of a personal question, but have you attained liberation? <laughs> no, not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. So, yeah. <laughs> are there people alive today that you think have attained liberation? <laughs> I would say that there's quite possible some monks in maybe Thailand, <laughs> and <laughs> maybe Burma, <laughs> maybe a few in the forests of Sri Lanka. <laughs> so they're they're all they're all that that they're all Theravadins. It sounds like it could be also maybe some some. Tibetan monks also, maybe some Chinese. Okay, all right. So now we're getting a little more ecumenical here. Yeah, I'm not to want to restrict it to one particular tradition. But we should say that your tradition is Theravada. Uh, of the two, you know, best known traditions, Theravada and Mahayana is the basic division in Buddhism. Theravada is clustered in the countries you you name. Yeah, yeah. Um. Okay. So I want to come back to there was a question that you started to ask just when the knocking came on the door, and that is you were asking whether it's necessary for a Buddhist to give up his attraction to every kind of enjoyment in the world, and this is a point which often, in my view, leads to misunderstanding of Buddhism, because one picks up reading about Buddhism and studying Buddhism using texts that were originally given by the Buddha to the monastics, to those who had renounced, you know, the household life in order to strive single-mindedly for nirvana. But now the Buddha taught many different people, teaching them in ways that are appropriate for their lifestyle, for their, you know, for their particular circumstances. And so the Buddha doesn't lay down injunctions for all of his followers to immediately give up you know, their wives, husbands, children, house uh, occupations, homes, and go forth into homelessness to enter the forest to lead a life of full-time meditation. But for those who are living the household life, you know, he teaches them the kinds of wholesome enjoyment that are appropriate to the household life. He teaches husbands how to take care of their wives, wives how to take care of their husbands, parents how to take care of their children children how to look after their parents, 
how lay people can work at forms of right livelihood and so on. And so I think it's wrong when reading Buddhism or incorrect to try to impose, you know, the model of monastic life on all Buddha's followers and expect that they're and think that they're all expected to live up to the level of, you know, renunciation and austerity that's expected of somebody who's made that full commitment. Right. The- and I, I think because of the way Buddhism has entered the West and the United States, there are a lot of Americans who actually think that all Buddhists meditate. But in fact, in Asia, most lay Buddhists do not. Yeah, that is actually the case. Yeah. Um, but that does lead to a question. So the, the basic doctrines of, of Buddhism, the, the Four Noble Truths, which is the, the diagnosis and prescription of what's wrong with life, and, and which uh, the last of which encompasses the Eightfold Path, which is the specific prescription for how to get better. Yeah. Uh, those they that's a recipe for liberation take you know, you know and so it leads to the question i mean do lay people in asia um lay buddhists pay a lot of attention to the four noble truths and the eightfold path even though taking it in its fullest form would mean you know renunciation and 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 more thoroughgoing meditation than they or would be inclined to do well, I would say that they approached the Noble Eightfold Path somewhat selectively in that they would try to adopt, this would be more knowledgeable lay people, they would try to adopt right view, the first factor in, in the sense of having the some understanding of the principles of karma and its fruits and the Four Noble Truths and other doctrinal principles of the teaching, which sort of constitute the, the objective domain of right view, they'll try to develop to some extent right intention in that they'll try to be working on their minds in order to develop some attitude of at least detachment from worldly um, involvements, but especially putting more emphasis on developing the right intention of kindness towards others and compassion towards others. They'll try to observe the moral code embodied in right speech, right livelihood, right action, right livelihood. And then at least the more serious lay people from time to time will go for meditation practice. Either what's commonly done is to go for meditation on the Uposita days. Those will be the days of the full moon and new moon. But still more serious, lay people will occasionally go for an extended meditation retreat. But the general run of lay people, for them, the primary way of practicing Buddhism is not so much through the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, but more, I'd say, the emphasis is on faith and devotion, and then through the practice of certain ritualistic observances, like the worship of the what we call the three jewels the buddha the dharma the sangha veneration of the bodhi tree having respect for the monastic order then practicing dana which means giving practicing generosity and in a buddhist society that means that there's an interrelationship between the lay community and the monastic order such that the lay community provides the monastics with their material needs, you know, with food, with lodging, with medical assistance, with robes. And then the monastics have the function of providing teachings to the lay people and also providing them with spirit, with spiritual and religious advice. Okay, so with devotional practices, generosity, and the observance of the precepts, particularly the five precepts abstaining from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech, and the use of intoxicants. Yeah, there are, I think, in in the United States, where a kind of, you know, relatively secular Buddhism has gotten a foothold, I think there's a view among some people that Buddhism doesn't involve a moral code, or, you, you know, and I, I mean, gather I, that's misleading. No, no, that is completely, I mean, completely wrong. Because if one looks through the Buddhist discourses, one sees again and again that the Buddha 
prescribes either the five precepts or else the, what are called the ten courses of wholesome action, which is a kind of expansion of the five precepts. And so I would say that, I mean, definitely it's the case that morality or the observance of ethical conduct is the foundation, the basis for the whole Buddhist path. The, now, you mentioned meditation, which is, uh, which is pointed to by, I guess, the final two uh, factors in the Eightfold Path, mm. um, mindfulness and concentration. Uh, uh, you, I gather, meditate a fair amount. Yeah. Most people watching this probably hasn't, haven't, and I, so I was going to ask you a little uh, to try to describe some of this from the, from the inside. Uh, I was speaking to a Buddhist nun not long ago, and, and, and one thing she said was that uh, while meditating, if she's, ha you know, if she's having uh, feelings, well, emotions, we would say, although emotions per se, and that in so many words I know are not very often addressed generically in the, um, in the canon, but when she's having feelings like, uh, you know, hatred, anxiety, when she meditates, she says she realizes they're not real. They're not what? They're not real. That the, that the emotions aren't real. Can you relate to that? Or does, it, does that relate to any anything you recognize in the meditative practice? I would not say that the emotions are not real. What I would say is that very, very often emotional states just arise and we build up thought constructions around the emotions. And sometimes there's not a reality behind those thought constructions. Like they're built up around, you know, completely imaginary ideas. And so we could say that emotions and thought constructions or emotions can cluster around thought constructions which don't correspond to things in reality. But I'd say that the emotions themselves are real but they don't have, often they don't have any kind of underlying substance. So if one doesn't let oneself become carried away by the emotion, but just notes it, observes it, and lets it pass, it will lose its kind of force or momentum. And it will just be recognized as a, a transient mind state arises and passes away. And so is there an example of a kind of thought construction that might accompany an emotion which is not itself in a sense true? That is, the thought construction is not upon examination true, and so and it might not have a chance to take form if you just let the emotion pass away? Well, maybe I'll give you a concrete example of this in my own experience. About, you see, when I was living in Sri Lanka, there was, in the monastery where I was staying, there was one monk who was making a lot of trouble for all of the other monks, a rather recalcitrant character. And at the time that I was in Singapore, this was the time when I was in Singapore when I found your book, Non-Zero, yeah, yeah, in the Singapore Library. Okay, at the time that I was in Singapore, the, the other monks in the monastery decided that they had to ask that monk to leave. Okay, now from Singapore, I went, I was on my way back to the U.S. and I stopped in Germany. And this was just at the time of the Buddha's birthday. And the people that I was staying with were taking me to the Buddha Society in Hamburg to participate in the Buddha's birthday celebration. And now this monk, the one that was expelled from our monastery was European. And I thought that he would be, or I heard that he would be going back to Europe for the summer, or for the, the late spring and summer. And so when we got to the Buddha Society, the woman who drove me looked through the window and she said, there's another monk in there. And I looked through the window and I saw, that's him. <laughs> And I thought, oh no, what's going to happen? I'm go as soon as I walk through, he's going to be yelling at me and criticizing me and blaming me for being part of this cabal to get him expelled from the monastery. 
and my mind was in an uproar, in a state of commotion. As we went through the door, taking off the shoes, it was getting, my mind was getting wilder and wilder. Okay, then we went through the door, and I looked inside, and there was the manager of this Hamburg Buddha Society sitting there with short hair <laughs> and an orange T-shirt. <laughs> and I looked around for the monk that I was afraid of. He wasn't there. And so I had built up this whole scene in my mind, all of this worry, all of this anxiety. How am I going to deal with him? All based just on a superficial visual impression of seeing the yellow shirt or the orange shirt and the man with a close shaved head in the window. Okay, so what about an example that is not quite as thoroughly illusory? Let's say, let's say there's someone that I hate, and, 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 and I, I think of them, and I feel the, the hatred, and I imagine pl plotting revenge or whatever, and I think of the things they've done to me that are the source of the grievance, and it is a fact that some of these interactions I'm remembering happened in some sense, right? Yes. But, but, but might there be a sense in which that thought construction is illusory, or at least not true, or not a true guide? Well, it could be that there is a, per for example, that there is a person who has acted spitefully and um, aggressively towards you. So there are various ways to deal with this. And the thing about the Buddha's instructions on meditation is that there's not just one simple way to meditate, but rather a whole variety of methods. Um, so often what we do at the outset of meditation is to use just a very simple method which sets up what I would call uh, setting up like a transparent screen in front of one's mind so that one could actually look into the mind and see what kind of thoughts are generally arising. Because when we're involved very much through the senses with outward engagements, we don't have a clear perception of what is actually taking place within our own mind. So often what is prescribed at the level of basic meditation is to make the simple effort to be aware of either one's breathing, in and out breathing, or the arising and the rising and falling of one's abdomen. And so it's a very simple task of simply being aware of, you know, a very, very basic process which is always occurring. And then what one finds as one makes the attempt to observe the in and out breathing or the rise and fall of the abdomen is that one becomes more clearly aware of what kind of thoughts are arising within one's mind. And so suppose that one is trying to be aware of the breath and then again and again thoughts of resentment against this spiteful and aggressive person start to arise. Okay, so one way that one could deal with this is just to recognize thoughts of anger, thoughts of anxiety, thoughts of resentment against this person, and let those thoughts go and bring the mind back to the breathing. And now as one stops giving attention to these thoughts, recognizing them, but not dwelling upon them, not linking the initial thoughts to a string of thoughts, is that one is subtly disempowering these thoughts so that the thought just becomes one event or maybe blips upon the screen of the mind. And so the, the thoughts will arise, one notes them, lets them go, and then other thoughts will arise. Or, or sometimes, you know, if one is more successful, one will be able to keep the mind steadily on the succession of in-breaths and out-breaths. And so in this way, the thoughts of worry, the thoughts of resentment will gradually grow weaker until, you know, when they do arise, then one will just be able to note them without being carried away by forceful emotions. Okay, but suppose that this sense of enmity or this resentment towards this person is very, very deeply rooted, maybe based on past experiences of you know, unpleasant interactions with that person. Then one could put down or adopt another approach to meditation, which is what we call the development of loving kindness, 
where one tries to develop towards other living beings or other persons, the wish for their welfare and happiness. And in this practice, one usually one doesn't begin with the person who's creating trouble for one. <clears throat> because if one begins with that person, as soon as one thinks of that person, the thoughts of anger and resentment will arise. But one proceeds gradually through a series of persons, beginning with oneself, recognizing one's own wish to be well and happy, and sort of the fundamental urge of one's own being. Then one passes through other people in groups, the dear and respected person, then a very close and beloved person, then a casual acquaintance like a neighbor or a colleague, then a neutral person. Then finally, when one builds up momentum in the practice by working through these people, then one can bring in the hostile person. Let me, you, when you mentioned, uh, you know, seeing thoughts arise and just kind of not choosing to associate with them, I, I think you're, you're, uh, that's related to a, a, a Buddhist doctrine that, that a lot of people find hard to accept or even understand, which is the, the not self doctrine, anatta. And I gather that one of the, uh, you know, there's various senses in which during meditation, you can come to appreciate that doctrine. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of them has to do with uh, the relationship you see to your thoughts, right? Yeah. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things, the factors that reinforces or empowers the thoughts is our identification with them. We take these thoughts to be me and mine, to be the core of our identity. And what the, the Buddha teaches is that the thoughts that are arise are just conditioned phenomena. You know, they're conditioned by past experiences, present conditions, and so forth. And so instead of identifying with the thoughts, and then it's when we identify with them that we then latch onto them. And then by latching onto them, one thought will generate another thought, which will generate another thought. And th so these, the succession of thoughts, as the succession of thoughts latch on to each other, become interconnected with one another, they create the sense of solidity, that we have some kind of solid identity at the core of our being. And so what the process of observing the thoughts does is to sort of cut away the connections between the successive thoughts so that we observe the thought, we note the thought, but we don't identify it, identify with it. We just label the thought as a thought of a particular kind. So it can be a thought of attraction, a memory, a fear, and some worry about the future, a thought of resentment about something that somebody did to us, planning for the future, but we just identify that thought and let, let it go. And so on the one hand, this disempowers the thought so that the thought no longer becomes something that persists and builds up this snowball-like momentum. And on the other hand, or at the same time, this method of treating the thoughts breaks up the sense of in a, of an inner core of personal identity, this grasping after the notion of a substantial, a solid and substantial self. Right. So the sense that most of us ordinarily have that we generate the thoughts uh, is just not there. You, you see that as false. When, when you, you can see that as false when you're meditating. Yeah, of course, on occasion, when we want to generate thoughts on a particular theme, then we can do so. so Observing thoughts in this way doesn't in any way weaken or debilitate our capacity for, you know, clear, consistent, logical thinking or reasoning if we want to use it. In fact, our ability, because we develop greater focus, greater clarity, we're able to use our uh, reasoning power, our capacity for thought more effectively, I would say. But what happens is that this way of treating the thought enables us to in a sense, to become masters of our own mind rather than to become 
subservient to the play of our own of our own thoughts. Okay. Now, people who are trying to make sense of this idea, this the not self doctrine. In other words, the idea that in some sense the self doesn't exist may be puzzled by the way you're describing this. You're saying, you know, we can, I mean, it's like we needn't, like I needn't identify myself with these thoughts. Right. But I can generate thoughts. But, of course, I'm still using the word I. I yeah. so, and that would seem to refer to a self. Yeah. I have a, a I, would, I would call it a rather nuanced approach to the talk, to the teaching of non-self. And I would not, say that the teaching of non-self means that there is no self or that we don't have a self. Though I would not say that when I explained it in that way, that it implies that we do have a kind of, you know, absolute, unconditioned, indescribable self, the way some of the Vedantin, you know, the Hindu interpret interpreters of Buddhism try to interpret uh, the Buddha's teaching of non-self. What I would say is that the Buddha uses different modes of discourse depending on the context. And so when he's speaking within what I would call a contemplative context, within the context of um, insight contemplation, or within the context of the aspiration for liberation, then he takes it that the primary obstacle to the attainment of liberation is the grasping or clinging to the mental and physical components of our being as a self. Or the primary obstacle, we could say, is the view of self that arises in regard to the mental and material constituents of our being, or to the clinging to the notion that I am, that there's some kind of true substantial core at the center of our being. And so in order to debilitate and to eliminate that clinging to the view of self and to the notion of a substantial I, the Buddha teaches not that there is no self, but that all of the objects of clinging are not self. And the objects of clinging are what he sums up in what are called the five aggregates or the five constituents, bodily form, feeling. Um, perception, mental functions or volitional activities, and consciousness. So within that framework, that liberative framework, or that framework of contemplative insight, the Buddha teaches that one should contemplate all the constituents of being as not mine, not I, not myself. But in other contexts, what I would call the context of ethical action, or the context of karma and its fruit, the Buddha teaches, again, not that there is a self, but he will use the language of selfhood, saying that, for example, one is responsible for oneself. One will inherit the re results of the deeds that you yourself do. Okay. So, so when you just listed these five things, these are known as the five aggregates, and, and, and they're the Buddha's division of all of our experience into five parts. Right, right. There, there, there are, as you said, there's feelings, there's, there's your senses, and, and, and so on. Um, I guess the one that puzzles me, and, and, well, and as you said, one thing he's saying, in particular in, in the famous first discourse on the not-self is, you don't have to identify with any of this, and in fact, it's an error to identify with any of it, and 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 that can be liberating in part because some of it is quite unpleasant. But the um, the one that kind of puzzles me is consciousness. You know, how do you not identify? Uh, you know, it seems to me, and I think there are other discourses in which the Buddha himself kind of talks this way. It seems to me that consciousness would be the thing that is not identifying with the other things, but if you try not to identify with consciousness itself, the question is, well, what is it that's not identifying with consciousness, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, what I would say is that definitely it's the case that it is consciousness which is not identifying with the other things, or it's consciousness which is exercising the act of disidentifying 
with the other things. Not engaging with them. Yeah. But this does not mean that consciousness then becomes a self which is sort of exempt from the principle of non-self. But rather, the Buddha also teaches that consciousness itself should be seen as not self, non-self, because consciousness also arises through conditions. And to demonstrate this, the Buddha distinguishes consciousness into what are called the six classes of consciousness, visual consciousness, which arises based on the eye and forms, auditory consciousness, which arises through the ear and sounds, smelling consciousness, tasting consciousness, tactile consciousness, and call it introspective or reflective consciousness, which arises based on the mind faculty and mental objects. Okay, so consciousness is conditioned, and consciousness also is subject to arising and passing away. So even though consciousness has a certain coherence or consistency, because different moments of consciousness link up, or different occasions of consciousness can link up into consistent, continuous patterns, but each act of consciousness itself arises through conditions, and each act of consciousness itself arises and passes away. I guess may, maybe another form of the question is, if you attained nirvana, you would still be aware of things. There would be awareness. There would not, uh, I, I think, I mean, have, having not attained it, I can't say for sure, but I, my understanding of the idea is that you would still be a sentient being. You would not feel a, attraction to things or aversion to things, maybe, and in that sense, your awareness would not be engaged with things. But yeah. there would be an aware being. There would be a, there. There would still be something like what I think of as consciousness. Oh, definitely. In fact, when one attains a, a person who's attained nirvana, would still have all five of the aggregates. I mean, of course, there's still a physical body. There's still a form. The person will undergo feelings, feelings of pleasure and pain. So there won't be the feelings that are connected with with craving, and the pain which is connected with ill will or or version, there'll still be perceptions, there'll still be volitional actions, there's still consciousness. All but what is just absent from the five aggregates will be the clinging to the notion of I, mine, and myself within them. Now, do you manage in your own life to to uh, sometimes treat physical pain that way? I mean, if you're if you're suffering from pain, can you meditate and not get rid of the pain per se, but but significantly lessen your suffering? Oh, definitely so. In fact, as I, I think I mentioned in, in the email, I have a, a chronic head pain condition, and sometimes it's very, very severe, particularly when the weather undergoes a sudden change. Um, and so sometimes I can't even do formal sitting in meditation. But what I could do is lie back and then I just observe the pain and just observe it with the reflection. This is not <laughs> not mine, not I, not myself. And it sort of takes away the subjective um, emotional involvement that often lingers around physical pain. So it becomes just an experience of physical pain. But it it doesn't trigger feelings of you know dejection, misery, self pity. So it's still unpleasant, just a lot less unpleasant than it would be otherwise. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there's a, a sutta where the Buddha gives a simile to illustrate this way of breaking the connection between physical pain and mental pain. He says he uses the simile of a person who might be shot first by one arrow, <laughs> and then he's shot by a second arrow. And so that person feels two, the pain of being shot by two arrows. So that's the example for a person who, phys who feels physical pain, and then based on that physical pain, he falls into you know, misery, dejection, uh, anguish, and self-pity. But a person who is able to practice mindfulness and clear comprehension, when that person feels physical pain, he just is able to observe it and sort of disconnect from it. And that way, it's just like being shot by one arrow. 
which can be painful, but yeah. yeah. So, but when you if you go to the dentist, you do get Novocaine, right? Um, I don't think I've had a cavity treated in a long time, but I did when I did have some dental op dental operations. I did get injected. I think with Novocaine. Okay. Let's move from one uh, kind of profound Buddhist concept, not self, to another, which is the idea of emptiness, or sometimes called formlessness. And it's in some ways you might say it's the idea of not self as applied to other things, and not just other people, but other, you know, furniture, uh, buildings, you know, things that you think of as having in some sense an essence. Um, hmm. What, what, can you talk a little about that and maybe talk a little about what, if you've had this perception of emptiness, perhaps while meditating or otherwise, you know, kind of, in a sense, feeling the emptiness or perceiving it, what that is, what that is like? Mm. Okay. Well, well, first, the theme of emptiness really becomes more prominent in Mahayana Buddhism, particularly the, the early stage of Mahayana Buddhism beginning with the Prajnaparamita Sutras and then as systematized in the philosophy of Nagarjuna, the Madhyamaka school. In the early teachings, we <clears throat> the early teachings give more stress on the adjective form sunya rather than the abstract noun sunyata, that is sunya as meaning empty rather than emptiness. And the early teaching treats sunya or the empty nature of phenomena pretty much as a synonym for non-self, the absence of a self within the person. And so there's a discourse, it's in the connected discourses. Um, it's the connected discourses on the six sense bases, chapter 35 somewhere in the 80s, 85, 88, something like that, where Ananda comes to the Buddha and says, there's a saying that the world is empty, the world is empty. In what sense, venerable, is the world empty? Then the Buddha says, the world is empty of self and what belongs to self. And then the Buddha elaborates, and what is it that is empty of self and what belongs to self? The I is empty of self. The ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, forms, sounds, odors, tastes, tactile objects, mental objects are empty of self and what belongs to self. Okay, so this is the way the idea of being empty or emptiness is treated in the early discourses. Now, what happened within the the more philosophical forms based on the early teachings is that since the Buddha denied the existence of a self or a substance within the constituents of the person or even the constituents, the outer constituents, the Abhidhamma schools, the philosophical schools of early Buddhism, developed the thesis that the person is devoid of a self or substance, but the basic constituents of personal identity have an ultimate or substantial reality. And so in this way, the Abhidhamma philosophy became rooted in the thesis that even though the person is not an ultimate reality, but the dharmas, the mental and material phenomena, are ultimate realities, substantial realities. And now in reaction to that, some of the early Buddhists or followers of early Buddhism thought, A, this is departing from the Buddha's original intention. It's a little bit like, you know, when you're sweeping, <laughs> sweeping the floor, you know, you sweep all of the dust into a corner and then you put the dust under the rug. You haven't gotten the dust out of the room yet. You're just hiding it under the rug. <laughs> so they were saying that you're not really getting rid of the idea of substantial reality, but all you're doing is transferring the idea of sub substantial reality from the person to the dharmas. And now you're glorifying what is a kind of subtle kind of selfhood, 
which is not the self of the person, but the selfhood or substantiality of the factors of existence. So then they proceeded from the fact that all the factors of actuality, all of the constituent factors, arise through causes and conditions. And so because they arise through causes and conditions, therefore they also lack any kind of swabhava, any kind of own being, any kind of intrinsic nature or substantial existence. And so then this fed into or developed into the teaching of emptiness, which is introduced within the first layer of Mahayana Sutras, the Prajnaparamita Sutras, and then becomes d developed by Nagarjuna. And this is, I mean, these two ideas are closely related, right? Uh, on the one hand, not self, let's say, as it applies to a person, and the emphasis on causes and conditions, that is to say, causality. I mean, isn't not self closely related to the idea that all human behavior is caused and yeah. the causes ultimately lie, can be traced to things outside of the human being, right? So, so my behavior is that in that sense continuous with factors outside of me, yeah. and the roots, the roots of all my behavior lie in that sense outside of me, not in some self. Maybe I'm going too far here, but because, and maybe you're going to stop me because ultimately. If I keep talking like this, I will sound like a complete determinist who yeah, is denying yeah. free will, and I'm not sure Buddhism wants to go that far, but there is there is something there, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. First, I wouldn't agree that all of the causes and conditions that are operating within us come from outside of ourselves. What I would say, because I accept the Buddha's teaching of rebirth, so what I would say is that there are habit formations, dispositions, um, tendencies, potentialities, pattern, dispositions towards patterns of behavior, which have been transmitted to us from the stream, <coughs> the stream of consciousness, which constituted our underlying nature from the previous, from previous lives. And those are passed on into the present life. So that there are already certain dispositional patterns which are already present, even from the moment of, well, we say that they're latent at the moment of conception, but let's say from the moment of birth. And I think maybe some researchers find this when they examine different, the way different babies behave. Some are happy and cheerful. Others appear, you know, upset and miserable. Some newborn infants show curiosity and a sort of positive attitude. Others are a bit aggressive in their behavior. So that already there are some dispositional patterns that come in from the people, from, I would say, from previous lives. And then even with the recognizing these dis dispositional patterns, I would say definitely according to the Buddha's teaching, there's not a hard determinism in the sense that all of our behavior is determined by these dispositional patterns and by the input from the environment. But it seems that the Buddha always leaves or recognizes what I would call a margin of freedom by which we have the ability to choose and respond to the, co the conditions that are acting upon us, both inwardly through the dispositional patterns and from the influences from our environment. But there is something to uh, the, the denial of essence of, of self is still to some extent related to an emphasis on how pervasive conditioned factors are, how, how much is caused. Oh, definitely the conditioning factors have a very, very strong influence. But the Buddha always emphasizes, as I said, that within that vast, um, convergence of conditioning factors, there's a certain margin of freedom by which we, within which we can choose how we're going to respond to the situations in which we find ourselves. And I gather the, the, the denial of essence to things outside of me, things I'm perceiving, also has something to do with how much 
uh, my conception of them has to do with my interpretation of them. So, for example, if I hear the sound of a jet airplane, I think that's the sound of a jet airplane, where somebody from another planet might not think that, and some animal might not think that. And, in fact, I might be wrong. You could simulate that sound when there's no jet airplane, yeah. And I would be wrong. That, that, the, 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 is, is that part of the idea that, that, that whenever we, we think of something as a form, we're actually bringing some interpretation to the raw sensory data? Yeah, definitely. There's a, a, a lot of overlay of, of interpretation of the sensory data. And also, I would say from the Buddhist perspective, that even our perception already tends to be infused with some degree or let's say with the disposition towards misinterpretation you know that there's a buddhist teaching which is called the literally the word means inversions the three levels of inversions so the inversions would be the inversion of taking to be permanent what is actually impermanent taking to be pleasurable or enjoyable what is actually dukkha unsatisfactory and taking to be self what is actually non-self and now these inversions operate at three different levels okay the grossest level is the level of view where this is the level where interpretation is most explicit but when actually formulates consciously and deliberately an interpretation of as aspects of one's experience and then presents a position that such and such is permanent or truly enjoyable or truly a self. This might be seen, for example, as in different philosophical systems. Okay, but taking that at a deeper level, the Buddha says that the inversion occurs already at the level of thought. And so the view arises from thought, which takes things to be permanent, enjoyable, or self. But then at the most basic level, the Buddha says that there is the perception of things as being you know, permanent, pleasurable, and self. And so it builds up from the level of perception in which there's already just this slight bias towards interpretation. And then that slight bias then triggers off sequences of thought so that when we start reflecting on, on our experience, these biases become more pronounced, more elaborate. And then the distorted thoughts feed into interpret, into full interpretation and issue in the distorted views. And I gather, and this is maybe an extension of what you just said, although I'm not sure you, you connect the two, but when we do interpret, we bring interpretation to something and thereby attribute essence to it, some of that interpretation involves how we feel about it. So I might, you know, my enemy is a bad person. My, my home is a warm cozy place part of the essence i'm attributing to things is coming from my feelings right exactly exactly and so it kind of follows that if you're following the buddhist path in extreme form if you truly seek liberation and you're 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 kind of divorcing yourself in a sense from feelings of attraction and aversion that then things in the outside world would not have these strong emotional connotations, and that might be part of your perception that they lack essence. Again, I'd have to nuance my response to this, um, because if one takes that too literally, one might come away with the idea that the ultimate aim of Buddhism is to become a completely unemotional, emotionally flat, emotionally deprived automaton. <laughs> as, as my mother used to say, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, between an enlightened Buddhist and a, veg and a vegetable, there's no difference. <laughs> Is this why you become a Buddhist monk, to become a vegetable? <laughs> but I would say that, in my opinion, in my experience, that as one continues to practice, you know, the Buddhist path, 
it enriches the emotional life. So that one becomes emotionally more sensitive, more happy and joyful. And I would say that one can respond to things in the world um, in a freer, more happy, more, more delightful way. So it's not that it's just turning, turning one into, uh, you know, just a flat, uh, an emotionally dead automaton. Right. But yeah. doesn't part of the freedom come from the fact that you are not attaching these affective connotations, these judgmental affective connotations to things you see? So, in other words, the la not attributing essence so strongly to things, it, it can be a source of freedom. Definitely, it brings, I would say, it brings the freedom from the kind of emotional disturbances that arise from, you know, usually as we usually live sort of swinging between the two poles of attraction towards what's pleasant, what's agreeable, what promises delight, and then repulsion towards what is seen as threatening, as um, unpleasant, um, you know, as disagreeable. And so, you know, when one develops this capacity just to recognize things without superimposing this interpretation upon them, when one encounters what is disagreeable and unpleasant, one could pass through it and um, bear up with it and even face it rather courageously and sort of change one's reaction to it. And when one meets with what is pleasant, one can even enjoy it, but without becoming attached to it and without building up one's emotional expectations upon it. So that one has to receive, say, reaffirmation from other people whose company we enjoy, or to be able to hold on and to possess things that give us pleasure. Well, maybe that's a good note to end on. I promised not to keep you more than an hour. Unless there's something you want to add about the practice, about Buddhism, that you think we haven't covered and should? Well, there are quite a lot of things. <laughs> but I don't know if you had any lingering, other lingering question that you wanted to ask. Maybe we could take one or two question, more questions. Well, maybe you... we could close with, uh, get back to some translation uh, issues, since that's uh, what you do a lot of. People, a lot of people heard the term Dharma, and I think they think of the um, teachings of the Buddha, and may, maybe in that sense the path that Buddhists follow. It's it's a much uh, broader and potentially richer word. Is is it? What are, what other things does it mean? Yeah, I think that first there are two ways to represent the word Dharma. One is as a singular, the other is as a plural. Now, as a singular, the word Dhamma has a more fundamental meaning than the teaching of the Buddha, but it means, I would call it, I would call it the fundamental principle of truth and goodness, which exists maybe as the fundamental law of the universe, we could say. And so what the Buddha does, he doesn't create or invent the Dhamma. He creates or invents the teaching. His teaching is intended to be a conceptual and verbal expression of the ever and ever persistent Dharma as this fundamental principle of goodness, righteousness, and truth. So the, the Buddha discovers the Dharma, and then he formulates it in the form of teachings, which will make known to humanity what are the basic principles of goodness, virtuous behavior, good and wholesome qualities to develop, and what are the fundamental principles of reality, the laws of reality that are to be penetrated, realized, and understood in order to gain liberation. When you say laws of reality, is that like what in the West we would call scientific laws? Well, in, these would be the principles rather of the Buddha's teaching, like the three characteristics, impermanent, unsatisfactoriness, non-self, and the law of dependent origination. Which is very much about causality in some sense. Oh, exactly, yeah, or conditionality. Yeah, so those would be the fundamental cognitive principles.
So could you say that Dharma is, on the one hand, the truth about the way things are, but also the truth about the way we should behave in recognition of the way things are? Exactly, exactly. And in Buddhist thought, and probably even more generally in Indian thought, the idea of goodness, of rightness, of correct behavior, and the idea of what is true and real are unified in a way in which the two come to be actually separated with the development of um, Western philosophy, so that ethics and metaphysics or, ont or ontology come to be rather separated rather sharply from each other. So, so Dharma, refers to both, sorry, sorry, it refers to both natural law and moral law, in a sense. Right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. You could say that moral law and natural law or at least the higher natural law, are unified within Buddhist thought. Though so they come to expression somewhat differently in that in terms of moral law, what's laid down are precepts or guidelines to conduct. And in terms of natural law, what is laid down are guidelines to contemplation and insight. Okay, so this is Dharma as a singular. Then and this seems to be unique to Buddhism and not to the in other Indian systems. In the plural, the word Dhamma comes to be used on the one hand for good qualities. Actually, maybe it's even used in three senses. One would be a sense of any kind of mental qualities, all the factors of mind, both good and bad. But then in a more narrow sense, sometimes dhamma is contrasted with a dhamma, good qualities contrasted with bad qualities. So then amongst the different mental factors, dhamma comes to mean the good factors in contrast to the bad factors. But then most broadly, the word dhamma comes to be used to mean all the constituents of actuality whether mental or physical, whether good or bad. And so when one is reading the text, one has to be able to, to interpret the text correctly. One has to know how Dhamma is being used within that particular passage or context. All right. Well, thank you so much. This yeah. has been very illuminating. And um, the... Uh, your backdrop has changed during this and, and, and uh, has gotten slowly darker, but your face has remained uh, illuminating okay. Um, okay. And, and, and illuminated, I guess. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm glad we uh, managed to have this conversation. In closing, I would, I would recommend very ambitious uh, readers to, uh, to, to, to pick up one of your translated uh, uh, versions of the, um, uh, of various parts of the Buddhist canon, and perhaps readers who have or people have less time on their hands really should download your uh, lectures on Buddhism, and we'll provide the link for that because I've found them very helpful. Yeah, but what I would recommend for those beginning, the like the connected discourses, is rather like a physics student going on to relativity theory. What I would suggest, I have an anthology, and also it's an exp it's quite an expense for somebody with a limited income, but as an anthology, it's called in the Buddha's words, a yes. paperback. We can show them that too. Okay, yeah. And that is sort of intended to organize uh, passages from the discourses in a s systematic, schematic way so that the reader can see the structure of the teaching. Okay. All right. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was great. Okay, I hope this will be helpful to your students. Very much. Okay, thank you.